Nuclear energy was first introduced to the world on a large scale through World War II, where the horrific destructive power of it was put on display by the United States dropping two nuclear warheads on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan. The purpose of these bombs being used was said to be to make a much more swift end to the war, and with Japan's surrender coming shortly after their use, that goal was seemingly achieved. However, whether it was their intention or not, the bombs also put on display the amount of power that could be derived from nuclear elements. And while bombs might have been the first large-scale use of nuclear fusion, it wouldn't be the last, or even necessarily the most destructive. Just six years after these bombs were used, the first nuclear power plant was made. By the 1970s, there were already over 200 power plants generating energy around the world. But while the world was starting to benefit from this new cheap energy creation, the downside of it wouldn't be apparent till many years later. Today, we'll be taking a look at the scars these nuclear charged pieces of technology have left behind, in order of their destructiveness. Starting off with the more tame examples of nuclear testing zones that are now safe, to parts of the globe so damaged they won't be safe to go near for decades. Let's take a tour of the nuclear wastelands left behind. But before we get into that, I'd first like to thank today's video sponsor, Babbel. Learning a second language is something that can be both very difficult and very beneficial. I have personally always struggled to learn a second language, even with traditional classes. But Babbel has made it easy. Babbel is a language learning app that completely simplifies the process of learning a new language. They focus on teaching the most important practical language to be used in conversation in short 10 minute interactive lessons. Because of this, Babbel has helped me in getting to a point where I was actually comfortable enough to use the Spanish I learned through their app on a recent trip to ask for directions to the nearest bus stop. In addition, they actually make learning interesting with podcasts, lessons, videos, and even games to help you on your journey. So whether you want to finally learn that new language or get that gift for the person who is always looking to learn more, Babbel has got you covered. If you'd like to give them a try and get up to 60% off, click the link down in the description below or scan the QR code on screen. Thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring this video and making this content possible. When taking a look at the less destructive examples of nuclear remnants, you'll most likely end up viewing those of testing sites, as they caused a large explosion, but usually didn't leave much radioactive waste behind. A great example of this comes from what is known as the Trinity Testing Site in New Mexico, US, where the first nuclear bomb, codenamed Trinity, was tested. Taking a look at the site today, it's hard to even know if the site where this bomb was set off 76 years ago. This is due not only to the large amount of time that has gone by and the small size of the bomb, but also the site at which it was detonated at. Barren deserts have become one of the most popular places for nuclear tests to be held at, due to the lack of occupants usually in the area. While the area itself is not very dangerous anymore, only being about 10 times more radioactive than the normal background radiation on Earth, the same cannot be said for the pieces of green glass scattered across the site. This glass, known as Trinitite, was created from the immense heat of the explosion interacting with the sand around the testing site and it is much more radioactive than most of the site itself. But other than the glass and the barren landscape, any other evidence of the explosion has been lost to time. This is anything but the case for our next example though. The US Marshall Islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean were a popular destination for early nuclear tests by the United States, with 67 total tests being conducted between 1946 and 1958 on the islands. While the nuclear fallout spread throughout all of the Marshall Islands, one in particular, Rudin Island, is home to a concrete dome covering almost 100,000 cubic yards of radioactive debris, the equivalent of 35 Olympic-sized pools filled with radioactive material. This dome was put in place in an attempt to reduce the radiation levels around the islands. And while there is no question that it's helped reduce these levels, this dome is not a forever solution. Recently, the dome's concrete has started to crack and has even possibly been leaking radioactive matter into the surrounding area. 
as warned by the U.S. Department of Energy in 2013. In addition, the dome itself only covers the top of the radioactive waste and not the surrounding areas, which in combination with the rising sea levels has caused water to be able to seep in and out of the dome, causing radiation to leak into the ocean. This issue will seemingly only become more of a problem as sea levels rise over time, eventually leading to the entire dome becoming submerged itself, exposing all of the radioactive material to the surrounding ocean. Even if the dome was constantly repaired and fixed, it still isn't a great solution, as the dome actually only covers the top of the island. Even more concerning, much of the area is still radioactive, including parts that people still inhabit to this day. In addition, this dome is only one piece of remnants that the nuclear warheads have left behind, with other craters scattered throughout the islands and the seawater surrounding them. While the detonation of nuclear bombs surely causes nuclear waste, the actual making of these bombs often leaves behind even more. One place where this can be seen is at our next stop, at Sellafield in the United Kingdom. Since the site's creation in the 1950s, it has been the location of nuclear reactors, plutonium manufacturing plants, nuclear waste cleanup facilities, and even home to what is the United Kingdom's worst nuclear accident. In 1957, one of the nuclear reactors on site, known as Pile 1, randomly caught fire and wasn't realized until days later. To make matters even worse, once the fire became apparent, remedies such as cranking up the fans, releasing carbon dioxide, and water all failed or made the fires even worse. It wasn't until the reactor manager ordered everyone out of the facility except himself so the air could be shut off that the fire was finally put to rest. Since then, the site's main purpose switched gears to the repurposing and cleanup of nuclear waste, complete with over 10,000 workers and even its own police force, making it the UK's largest nuclear site and interestingly, its most dangerous. This is due to a variety of reasons, but for starters, it's home to enough untreated nuclear waste to make 14 nuclear bombs, and that's only accounting for the plutonium. It's also where many of the older and decommissioned nuclear structures end up, much of which are at risk of collapsing according to an investigation by the BBC. Another area of the site that is cause for concern are the two ponds that are filled with nuclear waste and sludge. These ponds are a relic from past generations failed attempts at nuclear waste recycling, but are not properly maintained. As John Large, a nuclear safety expert puts it, in my opinion, there is a significant risk that the system could fail. In 2015, work on cleaning up these ponds started, but due to the staffing and budget shortages, they aren't expected to be decommissioned until the year 2054. This kind of idea seems to be the case for much of the site overall, a dangerous location littered with radioactive material that is not being properly dealt with due to a lack of funding and solutions. These failures prevalent on the site are only just scratching the surface of all of the issues there, and it seems like many of them won't be treated for decades to come, making the entire site a harmful mosh pit that could fall apart at any moment. However, at least this site remains out of harm's way of the surrounding inhabitants, unlike our next location. The Polygon in Kazakhstan was the location of the Soviet Union's nuclear testing, and today remains the most radioactive nuclear testing site in the world. From the years 1949 to 1989, over 400 nuclear bombs were tested at the Polygon. The site was originally chosen as a testing site due to the lower pollution in the area. But just because people didn't live within the testing site doesn't mean that people weren't exposed to the radioactive fallout of the bombs. The fallout of these bombs were felt by the surrounding area, and Kazakh health authorities estimate up to 1.5 million people were affected by them. The reason this number is so high is because the nuclear bombs going off not only exposed the surrounding population with immediate radiation, but also lingered in the wind, spreading radiation over much of Kazakhstan. While the exact number of people who died as a result of these nuclear tests are unclear, the evidence of them still remains today through the people of Kazakhstan, like Barak Sizdakov, 
who was born with anomalies as a result of his mother being exposed to radiation while pregnant with him. Sizdikov is just one example of these bombs' effects, with others also suffering from increased cancer rates, hair loss, radiation sickness, reproductive damage, heart failure, and even brain damage. To make matters even worse, people are still suffering from these today, due to the lack of resources available to Kazakhstan for the cleanup following the USSR's disillusionment. While some of the areas have been sealed off with the help of Russia and the US, many still maintain life-threatening radiation levels, and even more have their marks on the landscape through large craters. The polygon remains an example of not only the devastation a nuclear bomb can make when dropped, but also the long-lasting effects these bombs can cause. And the second most nuclear-torn place in the world is Fukushima, Japan. In March of 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck about 90 miles off the coast of Japan. This earthquake subsequently caused a 15-meter tsunami to form. This tsunami would eventually reach the Fukushima power plant, which while elevated above sea level, was only elevated about 10 meters. The power plant was quickly overwhelmed by the waves of the tsunami. Although the reactors were able to be shut down successfully, the flooding from the wave caused the backup generators to fail as they were flooded. This caused the cooling mechanisms of plants 1-4 through four to become non-functional. Although attempts were made to bring backup batteries for the coolers, the tsunami made the transport of them difficult, and three of the plants ended up suffering core meltdowns, releasing radioactive material into the atmosphere. To make matters even worse, multiple hydrogen explosions also occurred in the fallout including one in a containment zone, which furthered the radioactive spread. Ultimately, a concoction of radioactive material, including iodine-131 and cesium-137, were released from the disaster, causing a 12-mile exclusion zone around the site. The radioactive fallout even ended up spreading to Russia and the US in the following days. But in just a few short weeks, traces of it were found across the entire Northern Hemisphere. When taking a look at the damage caused by this particular nuclear meltdown, there are multiple things to consider. First off being the damage from the meltdown itself, and then the damage caused by the tsunami that destroyed much of the surrounding area. This gives an interesting perspective on the entire disaster, because as the tsunami caused a large amount of physical damage, the radioactive fallout caused this area to become uninhabitable and remain not cleaned up for years. A place destroyed by a tsunami and then simultaneously frozen in time. As for the areas that weren't as harmed by the tsunami, they now present abandoned relics of human structures that are slowly being reclaimed by nature. And interestingly enough, we are only in the beginning of this particular disaster's history, as it occurred only a little bit over 10 years ago, and the area will not be inhabitable for at least 100 years, leaving the question of what it will look like in 10, 20, or even 50 years. Interestingly enough, our final location might give us a glimpse into that. And that location, if you haven't already guessed it, is Chernobyl, the site of the 1986 reactor meltdown that completely decimated the surrounding area. I'm sure many of you know about the story of Chernobyl, but for those who don't, on April 26, 1986, a reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was undergoing a test regarding a power outage when things began to go terribly wrong. Due to the improperly trained operators, a design flaw, and the nature of the test, the reactor got out of control and caused a massive explosion. To make circumstances worse, there was no protective dome over the reactor, causing a plethora of radioactive materials to spread across the surrounding area. Two individuals were killed from the explosion itself, and 28 members of the cleanup team died in the following months. However, these casualties were just the beginning. The radioactive elements ended up spreading across an area of almost 150,000 square kilometers and spread across multiple countries. Today, the areas of this region further from the blast are perfectly safe to live in. However, as you venture closer to the site, this becomes less and less true, especially within the 30 kilometer exclusion zone, where trees with visible mutations, animals with physical deformities, and abandoned communities and towns start to become more common. The site itself, even to this day, is a desolate landscape more akin to something you'd see in a post-apocalyptic movie, 
than in real life itself. Buildings and streets are slowly being reclaimed by nature, weathered down and overgrown with plants. Once populous regions now left completely abandoned. Right after the explosion, the radiation levels in the immediate area were around 300 sieverts per hour, enough to give a fatal dose in just a few minutes. However, because the disaster happened over 35 years ago, the levels have gone down quite a bit. Nowadays, those regions register about 10 million times weaker than then, but there are still areas like the Jupiter factory basement that are much more radioactive and dangerous to this day, which have still not been properly cleaned up. Today, the site of Chernobyl is not nearly as dangerous as it once was, but the abandoned wasteland left behind serves as a reminder of a time when it was one of the most dangerous places on all of Earth. Overall, it's interesting to see how little control we have over things sometimes, where huge machines made to power the world at one moment are causing evacuations and making areas uninhabitable for decades to come. It really paints a strange picture. This video was partially inspired by Veritasium's look into the most radioactive places in the world today, and I'd highly recommend checking it out if this sort of thing interests you. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing or leaving a like or comment with your thoughts on it. And thanks to my Patreon supporters for making this content possible. Thanks again and have a good night.